Hey there, folks. This is Pop Culture. I'm Alex Pop, and this is part five of my spoiler talk for Jurassic World Dominion. Something that I'm frankly getting tired of hearing from critics of these movies, as well as other monster movie blockbusters and whatnot, is when they let out the complaint of, we don't care about human characters. Why do these movies think we do? The answer is incredibly simple, because it's the human world. Whether it's the rise of kaiju in the monsterverse, a Transformers invasion, or the revival of the dinosaurs, it is vital that the story be told from our level to fully bring that scary and awe-inspiring feeling that it's our world this phenomenon is happening to. I mean, would the original Jurassic Park be as wondrous as it is if it wasn't about people seeing dinosaurs? Do you really think it would be hailed as a classic to the degree it is today if it didn't have such great human characters? And with Jurassic World Dominion as the final film in the core Jurassic story with several characters to bring closure to, the human element was more important than ever. When it was announced that Sam Neill, Laura Dern, and Jeff Goldblum were all returning for this movie in major roles, I was psyched. It was just the right time to do so. I was glad that the old cast was never shoehorned in to the previous two Jurassic World movies. Since none of them would go back to the islands, it made sense that they were absent in those movies, aside from Goldblum's cameo role in Fallen Kingdom. But now, with dinosaurs roaming free in the world, it was the ideal time to bring them back into the picture. And yet somehow, they're not even really dealing with dinosaurs in this movie. Still, when Alan Grant, Ellie Sattler, and Ian Malcolm all joined up for the first time since 1993, for that moment, time stood still. Which was inevitable for me. When they all reunite and when they meet with the Jurassic World characters, that was always going to be the case for me. Even if they were all coming together just to dig through dinosaur crap for two and a half hours. Which now that I say it isn't too far from the fact. So on the surface, I love what I see, but then I have to think critically about what the substance underneath is. To give a small example, take the part during the group's encounter with the Giganotosaurus, when Malcolm slips and almost falls off a ladder, but Grant is there to grab his arm and say, I gotcha. A part of me is heartwarmed by that moment merely because it's Grant and Malcolm, two characters I've always loved. But on the other hand, I have to lower my nostalgia goggles and say that anybody could have written that. Now, bringing a solid conclusion to so many character arcs is certainly a challenge, but one that I did see a very clear path to accomplishing with Dominion. But for whatever reason, the movie ignored the GPS. One or two of the character storylines are done okay, but most of them not so much. To start, the natural progression to the storylines of Claire, Owen, and Macy would be that they all share this goal of finding peace and redemption in the new world that they helped make. While it was predominantly the greed and villainy of Eli Mills that got the dinosaurs on the mainland to begin with, Claire and Owen did feel regret for the part that they played even before the dinosaurs got loose. This is not your fault. But it is. No. This one's on me. I showed him the way. And yes, it was Macy who made the defining move. So I was really interested to see how the three of them, especially Macy, were going to be vindicated. If you haven't seen part three of the Spoiler Talk series, that's where I go into detail as to why I really didn't like where Macy's story was taken in this movie, and I say that as someone who really did like her storyline in Fallen Kingdom. So to zero in more on Claire and Owen, they are, in the words of Eli Mills, the parents of the new world. You can easily see the road they were going down at the end of Fallen Kingdom, as they absorb the precarious and uncertain future that their efforts to save the dinosaurs has helped lead to. But when Dominion starts, we don't get the natural progression of that. They're even yet still fixated on saving dinosaurs, which to an extent would be fine, except they don't put any of their focus on the peril that dinosaurs pose as well. We never see them thinking about protecting human life from carnivores, or possibly protecting public property from giant sauropods. The closest thing we get to anything of that nature is when it's Macy who recommends to the construction workers how to help lead the apatosaurs away from the town. If dinosaur poaching was the only issue that would come from this, Claire would have had no problem pressing that button and freeing them into the world. It is hinted at a couple of times that Claire is harboring some regret, but it doesn't mesh with the story the movie chooses to tell. When she and Ellie Sattler are talking as they go down into that control room, about to face off against some giant bugs, Ellie says to her, 
If we hold on to regret, we stay in the past. What matters is what we do now. That line doesn't carry any weight, though, because what they're doing now isn't about dealing with anything that Claire had a hand in. What should those words mean to her in this situation? It's like there's a faithful sequel to Fallen Kingdom trying to push its way in here and there, but never manages to show its face. Are we meant to feel like she, as well as Owen and Macy, are vindicated by helping defeat this bigger threat posed by Biosyn's Locus? Because that would be a really feeble cop-out. And because I thought it would be a given that this movie was about facing the ramifications of the past, something that I found quite interesting from watching the trailers was the Malta chase. You think about how the Indoraptor in Fallen Kingdom was designed to be a mini Indominus Rex with the compliant traits of blue that came from Owen's research on raptors. With the Indoraptor prototype came that laser targeting system, and word about that evidently got out from the auction because it carries over into Dominion with the Atrociraptors. And you might say there's an element of imitating Owen's research involved with these new raptors too, because Owen and Barry managed to use that hand technique to hold one of them off. Though I can't say that with certainty, considering how the same thing works on a freaking Carnotaurus and Allosaurus a few minutes earlier. Still don't know what they were thinking there. But to the point, the ripple effect is easily perceptible, and it creates what would be an interesting role reversal. In Jurassic World, there Owen was feeling unstoppable as he was driving his motorcycle with raptors running with him at his side, his research to establish dominion over them seeming to have paid off. In Jurassic World Dominion, here Owen is again on a motorcycle, this time being chased by raptors, his research coming back to literally bite him. It would have been more than just another action sequence, it would have been a great piece of visual storytelling. That is, if the themes and ideas presented in the movie supported it. But the story doesn't have anything to do with dealing with the consequences of the past, or with the fear that man and dinosaurs might undergo a role reversal. So while the Malta chase is entertaining, it doesn't bear the significance I thought it would. Now, there are little moments with the world characters where I think to myself, yeah, I like that. As I said in part two, the send-off to Owen and Blue's dynamic was really good. And there's that moment when, as Kayla's plane is crashing, Owen has Claire be the one to escape on the lone ejector seat, saying to her, you're her mother, you're her best chance. After Claire's experience a Jurassic World that sold her on the virtues of being a mother, you have to think that in the possible face of death, it was fulfilling to get that affirmation from Owen. As for the new character of Kayla Watts, cheeky that the person wielding the taser is named Watts, I think it's lightly implied that she's intended to lead the future of Jurassic, which honestly, if this movie had brought better closure to the other heroes, I would be fine with. Is she all that essential to this story? Not particularly. She's mostly just there to be the transportation service whenever needed. Which, to be fair, is still more than Alan Grant contributes to the plot. But she wasn't an unpleasant addition to the adventure or anything like that. I did actually think that she and Owen worked off each other quite nicely. My favorite line of hers is when the Quetzalcoatlus is flying over her plane. She goes, Quetzalcoatlus, Lake Cretaceous and should have stayed there. Though it was when she said that that I began to wonder... Why are so many characters in these movies quick to specify when a dinosaur is from the late Cretaceous period? Is that a... Quetzalcoatlus. Late Cretaceous should have stayed there. Pachycephalosaurus. Carnivore? Uh, no, no. Herbivore. Late Cretaceous. This is a herbivorous quadruped. Late Cretaceous. I mean, does anybody really care? I guess Tim Murphy's influence is like an airborne virus. I did also kind of like Ramsey Cole, Biosyn's head of communications. Like when he's talking to Grant and Sattler in the helicopter, he's trying to keep things professional, but you can still kind of tell there's a starstruck fanboy in him. I think this may come from the fact that Mamadou Uche has been a lifelong fan of Alan Grant, as he's mentioned in a few of the featurettes. And the legacy characters, like I said, I love seeing them together again. The trio of actors, they get right back into it just as if they hadn't left. I have to say, out of the three movies she's appeared in, Laura Dern is particularly good in this one, especially when she's catching up with Gran at the dig site. And their chemistry with Malcolm was often funny. Probably the biggest laugh I got was Grant getting thrown off by his bleak philosophies. As they say, it's always darkest just before eternal oblivion. What? <laughs>
Indeed, Ian Malcolm is the most enjoyable part of this movie. I mean, it's Jeff Goldblum doing some great Jeff Goldbluming. The part that definitely took me back to Must Go Faster is when he's trying to unlock the gate that Grant Sattler and Macy are trapped behind, and as they're freaking out about the Dimetrodons attacking, he's just like, let's all try to stay positive, says Mr. Doomsday Clock is about out of time. So many instances when he was on screen, I had a huge smile ear to ear thinking, oh yeah, same old Ian. There's even a part where he mentions that he now has five kids, so I guess we can presume that he had two more with Sarah Harding? That is, unless he's still only married occasionally, which is not inconceivable knowing how flirtatious he still is with Sattler. And I won't lie, possibly Malcolm's most savage moment ever is when he stabs that long stick into one of the flaming bugs, using it to lure the Giganotosaurus away from his friends. That alone makes us think of his moment in the first movie when he lured the T-Rex away with the flare, so what we're expecting is for him to do the same thing here, start running with the flaming stick. But instead, this time, he stands his ground and throws the fire into the Giga's mouth. There's no downplaying it, that was Beast. As great as Malcolm is, though, this movie doesn't give him anything in the way of closure, and I really feel like it should have. I'll get back to that in a moment. What I will say right now, I know some of you may be perturbed at my mere suggestion of this, but wouldn't this have been a good time to adapt Ian Malcolm's death from the Crichton novel? Hear me out. In the book, John Hammond hated Malcolm, but the thought of Malcolm dying from his injuries frightened Hammond more than anything. He felt like it would be the ultimate rebuke. Some of Hammond's character from the novel was given to Dr. Wu in the Jurassic World movies. So what could have happened is during the third act, Malcolm is mortally wounded, and this becomes Dr. Wu's greatest motivation to fix his errors, seeing this happen to the man who first warned him all those years back that the power he was dealing with was out of his hands. A scene like that would have been even more effective if Wu was trying to make up for his past mistakes instead of this entirely different one. And when these two groups of characters finally collide for the last half hour, I gotta be honest, it's pretty underwhelming. Again, on the surface, I love what I see. It's three generations of Jurassic characters all working together. But the thing is, there's a difference between seeing and experiencing. There's some chuckle-worthy dialogue between them, sure, but no time for any deep conversations or even a chance for just some chill talk a la No Way Home. They try that one time to add in a meaningful moment between Claire and Ellie, but like I said, it really falls flat because of what the movie focuses on. And as I was watching these six characters, I couldn't stop thinking that this should be so much more engaging than it is. When you take the plot of the movie and replace it with what it so obviously should have been about dealing with dinosaurs in our world, and when you have the legacy characters involved, the scenarios write themselves. You would have these two very different groups of people coming together. First you have Grant Sattler and Malcolm, who visited the park more times than they cared to and were vehemently against it ever happening. And then you have Claire and Owen, who were involved with the park when it was open, and thus are more sympathetic toward the dinosaurs than the other group, especially Malcolm. So basically, it's both sides of the debate in the last movie actually meeting in person. The thing I loved about the moral dilemma of Fallen Kingdom is that even though the plot focuses on people who are on one side of the debate, there is still no absolute right and wrong. So in the following movie, when these people are together trying to figure out dinosaur stuff, it'd make for a compelling, meaningful, and even timely story about pulling together to find common ground in the face of a global crisis. But sadly, there's nothing like that in Dominion. The only instance where differing perspectives or attitudes toward the dinosaurs seem to interact at all was just in another ha-ha moment, when Owen says that he made a promise to Blue that he would save her baby, and Malcolm's like... You made a promise to a dinosaur. Yeah, why? If this was more what the character's dynamic was about, it would make for a good closing arc for Malcolm. I really thought that the movie was going to take its cue from that conversation between Grant and Eric in JP3. Did you read Malcolm's book? I, I don't know. I mean, it was kind of preachy and, and too much chaos. Everything's chaos. It seemed like the guy was kind of high on himself. It's two things that we have in common. 
So what I would have done for this movie is start with Malcolm being all about doom and gloom, and how the emergence of dinosaurs in our world is the very slow and painful extinction of mankind done by our own hand. And Biosyn could be using him as a puppet because they want to stoke the world's fear of dinosaurs and bank off of it. This would even play into what Macy's story in this movie should have been about. Like she hears Malcolm on TV talking about how this is all chaos and disorder, and she reflects on her decision to free those dinosaurs. It makes her look at her connection to these creatures in a different light, and really makes her question her worth, thinking to herself, maybe I'm just chaos myself. But eventually, Malcolm goes through some character growth when he has this experience with the other legacy characters and the new, and when he meets Macy and finds out what she is, which, just so that there's no confusion, is exactly what we knew her to be in Fallen Kingdom because that makes sense. So whether Malcolm lives or dies by the end, he would come to see that not everything is chaos, and that some change can be manageable and even beneficial in some respects. Unfortunately, though, much of this isn't possible, because instead of this movie being the true culmination of the franchise that it should have been, they decided to get all these characters together over bugs and not dinosaurs. They fight plenty of dinosaurs, sure, but it's only something they do in the meantime, because, you know, it's just the image we care about, right? We don't care about any of the substance or purpose behind it. You'll notice that's the one thing that I keep bringing up in every one of these videos. And it really goes to show that it is the root of so many major issues I have with this movie. The fact that it's not about adapting to the presence of dinosaurs in our world. And yet the ending has the audacity to act like that was the movie we just saw. I can't stress enough how far beyond me it is how... After building up this radical shift in the status quo, you become so deluded to think that the thing we give a crap about next is locusts devouring crops. I do recall Colin Trevorrow and Emily Carmichael saying in an interview that their goal was to come up with a genetic power-related disaster that would get the attention of a botanist because they wanted Ellie Sattler to be a narrative driver in this movie. And I suppose the reason for this may be that Grant and Malcolm each got a movie of their own while Sattler never did. But if you want to give her an actual solo movie, I mean, Laura Dern's not as old as Sam Neill and Jeff Goldblum. She could probably stay with the franchise longer than them. You could send her off on her own little adventure, something more plant life related, maybe work in some other Crichton-esque ideas in there as well, and I'd be there for it. You wouldn't even need to throw in dinosaurs just as an irrelevant nuisance along the way. Go ahead and branch out into something different. Show us just how destructive genetic power can become. Pay off that little line from Malcolm at the beginning of Fallen Kingdom about how it won't stop with the de-extinction of the dinosaurs. That's alright. But for the love of Petrie, finish with what we've already got going on here first. Doing this locust plot now doesn't work as the climax of the saga. It pivots from the ideas and character beats set up by Fallen Kingdom in favor of this detached side story masquerading as the climax. So when that side story is over and the movie ends, it just feels like we're in the same place we were when the movie started. Even the final shots of these characters are nothing memorable. The last time we see Claire, Owen, and Macy is a brief shot of them sitting around a campfire and laughing during the final voiceover. The last time we see Grant and Sattler is when they're preparing to testify before Congress about Biosyn. And the last time we see Malcolm is... What was the last time we saw Malcolm? I don't even remember, and I've seen the movie twice. Was it when they were all boarding the plane home? I think it was. Just imagine the ending we could have gotten. These heroes all meet up one last time to enjoy each other's company. Claire, Owen, Grant, and Sattler watch as Macy is frolicking with some microceratus, and then they all look out at the view of the sun setting over a valley filled with dinosaur herds taking in the world that they've learned to adapt to. We hear one last call from a Brachiosaurus just as the credits begin rolling with John Williams' Welcome to Jurassic Park. That's another thing, too. There was far, far too little of the classic Jurassic theme in Dominion. We hear only two or three fragments of it in the entire film. If you're going to call this the epic conclusion of the Jurassic era, you need to close out the movie with either, again, the same peaceful music that closed out the first movie, or the most epic, grandiose rendition of the theme ever, something like the version by Two Hooks Music. Give it a listen, it's awesome, the link is in the description. Maybe we'll see some of these characters again somewhere down the road. 
Frankly, I'm hoping that this movie's pitch of being the conclusion of the core Jurassic story is just another part of all the false advertising. Actually, this would be my pipe dream. That Sam Neill wasn't being hyperbolic when he said that they shot a six-hour movie. That the other three hours is a wildly different version that Colin Trevorrow is conspiring about releasing later, like Zack Snyder's Justice League. But it's a pipe dream. So even though I did enjoy seeing all these characters together, this really is a terrible note for them to go out on. Everything was there to make this an incredible finale where all these characters and their past collide in ways that are really complex. But I guess, to quote Sattler in this movie, we don't have time for complex. So what are your thoughts? You agree with my points? Disagree? How did you feel about how all these characters were handled? Was their meetup everything that you wanted? Whatever it be, let me know in the comments. If you're wondering why I didn't bring up Alan Grant more here, it's because, as my Jurassic hero, he deserves his own video. That'll be part six. That's a wrap. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Like and share, subscribe for more. This is Pop Culture. I'm Alex Pop.